Imagine a tally of the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere right now. As we emit, it goes up. And as we remove emissions from the atmosphere, it goes down. Imagine that you've planted a tree. As it grows, it pulls CO2 out of the atmosphere. Now say you were to take that tree and use it to create energy. You burn it as biomass, which is great because now you have energy. But in doing so, you produced carbon dioxide. That CO2 will go back into the atmosphere. But we could capture those emissions before they escape. We could take that CO2 and store it deep underground in the same natural reservoirs where things like natural gas lay dormant for millions of years. Taken separately, these are two familiar parts, bioenergy and carbon capture and storage. But if we put them together, something interesting happens. The tree has pulled the CO2 out of the atmosphere and we pulled the energy out of the tree. But the carbon didn't get back into the atmosphere because we sequestered it underground before it escaped. New energy without the additional emissions in the atmosphere. That's BEX, otherwise known as bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. We wanted to know more so we called up Jamie Stephen, Managing Director at Torchlight Bioresources, to tell us about their Rocky Mountain Carbon Project at the Hinton Pulp Mill. We discussed the Alberta Advantage for Bioenergy, the Rocky Mountain Carbon Project, and how to keep captured carbon safely stored for the long haul, here on Carbon Copy. So to get started, Jamie, can you introduce listeners to Torchlight Bioresources? So Torchlight is a bioenergy advisory and project developer. Uh, we were founded in 2008 um, and have, you know, since that time, have been working at the interface of the energy, forestry, agriculture, and waste sectors to really advance bioenergy specifically in Canada uh, and more broadly uh, around the world. Great, thank you. Uh, and can you tell us what does working with nature mean to you? So working with nature, I think there's a bit of a philosophical idea here in that there's some people in our society think that humans should be separated from nature. Um, you know, number one, this is just not going to happen. It's impossible. But number two, I don't think it's desirable. Uh, humans can have a very negative impact on nature, but they can also have a very positive impact. Uh, we don't hear that positive impact uh, on, on a regular basis. It's normally about humans are bad here, they're bad here. All we do is, is wrong when it comes to um, nature. But we are part of nature. And so that means that we have to work with nature to realize the outcomes that we want, whether that's environmental, economic, social, etc. cetera. Um, and, and that means that it is important that we talk about partnership, and uh, being able to have positive outcomes for both humanity and for uh, the environment. I really like that. It's a very optimistic way of looking at things. Um, so on this podcast, we're talking about BEX or bioenergy with CCS. So I'm wondering if you could give us a quick crash course on carbon capture in general and then specifically on BEX. No problem. So BEX stands for bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. So it's not BEX, it's B-E-C-C-S. So, you know, there's two parts to that. One is bioenergy and the other is CCS. So carbon capture and storage, you know, there can be, there's different pathways to do this. The most traditional one is what we call post-combustion capture, whereby, you know, if you burn anything, you're creating CO2 emissions. And so we can capture those from what's called the flue gas. What in general, the flue gas is not 100% CO2 when you're using um, air for combustion. And so what we have to do is purify that CO2, that's the capture part, and then we have to inject it subsurface, you know, two, three kilometers below the surface of the earth for permanent storage of that carbon dioxide. Uh, we already have commercial projects in Alberta, Saskatchewan, and other places in the world where we do carbon capture and storage largely on fossil fuel-based CO2 emissions. 
bioenergy is different because it is still the same. It is still CO2, but instead of burning a fossil fuel, it is burning of biomass. Um, the key thing, the key difference here is that the, when you're using biomass as the source of CO2, that carbon dioxide was originally in the atmosphere. And when a plant grew, it pulled that carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And when we capture it and put it permanently underground, that's actually, that pathway is a removal from the atmosphere. So in a way, it's like reversing climate change because we're utilizing, and this goes to the theme of working with nature, we're utilizing the incredible ability of plants to pull CO2 out of the atmosphere and then combining it with our engineering expertise to capture it and put it permanently underground. Great. Thanks, Jamie. So you said that BEX is different from doing carbon capture on fossil fuels because it's a carbon removal. Could you tell us a little bit about why carbon removals are important for the economy and for mitigating the effects of climate change? So carbon removals, number one, um, it is important to understand that every uh, reduction in CO2 emissions or greenhouse gases that we want to realize, there is a cost associated with that. Sometimes that cost is actually negative, so it's, it, it pays to do that reduction. But most of them, there is a cost associated with it. And depending upon the source of emissions, that cost can be very small or it can be very large. And in some cases, we don't actually have a pathway to avoiding that, that, that greenhouse gas emission. So, you know, and it can be $10,000 a ton. The reality is, is that there is a economic limit to what people, companies, society can bear in dollars per ton of CO2, right, in terms of reducing that emission. So while it's really important that we reduce emissions, you know, um, this means like fuel switching, etc. That's actually an important role for bioenergy in reducing that emission. But in some cases, and actually in quite a lot of cases, the cost is so high that the, the reality is we're not going to eliminate those emissions by reducing them. The alternative is actually to allow that emission to occur because society still demands things like aviation, jet fuel, etc., but to pull the CO2 emissions out of the atmosphere after the fact. So what that, what that means is that you're actually on a net basis eliminating the CO2 from the atmosphere, right? So in some cases, we're continuing to use fossil fuels, but then removing the emissions. And that, in many cases, as I say, is more economically efficient than trying to reduce the emission at source. So as we talk about net zero, it's not called absolute zero. It's called net zero for a reason, because there's two sides of the carbon ledger. One is emissions and the other is removals. And so this is a permanent removal. This is not a temporary offset. You know, we're planting trees, etc., um, very important, you know, avoided deforestation, really important things. But this is actually permanent removal that a thousand years from now, 10,000 years from now, we can still be confident that that CO2 that was emitted from a fossil fuel has actually been removed. And that's because it has gone underground and been sequestered geologically that we know it's removed. Yes. So pretty much everything above ground by definition is temporary. Right. So it could be reversed. There are other forms of carbon removal that have dur what we call durability, how long they exist in the hundred to a thousand years time period. For instance, one is called biochar. Right. So you're um, creating a a carbon product or carbon. Um, you're essentially driving oxygen and hydrogen out of the carbon or out of the, the biomass and creating a very high carbon uh, material that won't degrade rapidly uh, and can be applied to land. The challenge with that on a permanent basis is we don't control what's going to happen to land a thousand years from now. It's only when it's subsurface that we can be have a very high level of confidence that that CO2, that carbon will remain below ground and out of the atmosphere. Thanks. That gives us a little more context on removals and permanence. And I just have one more follow-up question. You mentioned aviation. Um, could you give any other examples of industries that might benefit from carbon removals? 
Well, so when we look at the emissions in the world, there's about 54 gigatons, so 54 billion tons of anthropogenic, that means human-induced greenhouse gas emissions every year. Uh, for about half of those, it is lower cost to do a BEX carbon dioxide removal in Alberta, which is a great place to do it, than to actually reduce the emission or eliminate the emission through fuel switching, other mechanisms. So when we talk about economic efficiency, and I think what we've seen over the past several years in Canada is, you know, there was a, there was a um, thinking that we might, up, that we're going to electrify everything. But I think the reality is that people are starting to recognize that that's not going to be the case because of the cost associated with doing that um, is simply too high in for some sources of emissions. And so there's lots of other sources of emissions that that half of that 54 gigatons, whereby it's lower cost to do our removal. So not to say that the reductions aren't really important because they absolutely are, but there is a limit to what people and companies can spend per ton of CO2, per ton of CO2 equivalent. And this is where BEX comes in because it is by far the lowest cost means of generating a permanent, permanent carbon dioxide removal. So other industries, for instance, in some cases, steel. Um, there are different pathways to steel um, production. Some are much lower carbon than our traditional uh, basic oxygen furnace, etc. cetera. And, and, the, and the industry is going that pathway, but they often still involve natural gas. And so there's places where we can do carbon capture and storage on that, but then there's other places that we can't. Um, simply through the geology isn't attractive enough, for example. And in this case, removing the CO2 emission um, is going to be lower cost because ultimately this is, you know, climate is not about eliminating fossil fuels entirely. It is about decarbonization and it's important that we focus on what is the goal and the goal is decarbonization. The goal is not complete elimination of fossil fuels. Right. Thanks, Jamie, for giving us kind of the broader picture. Um, so I'm going to take a little bit of a step back, um, and I would like if you could tell us a little bit about uh, your company, Torchlight's approach to innovating around CCS in and BEX in the forestry sector. So first of all, I think it's important to understand the scale of what we're, what we're dealing with here, right? So the forest product sector in Canada has historically been a very important sector for the country. Um, it is a very large energy consumer, though. However, most of those that energy consumed is actually from biomass. It's in it's bioenergy. So, you know, 75, 80 percent of the energy consumed by the industry is already renewable. And a lot of it is residues from the production of lumber and pulp. Right. So, for instance, you can't produce craft pulp, which is what we use for printing, writing papers, etc., like that, without generating energy um, because you're extracting a part of the wood and therefore you're, you're creating energy from that. Um, the scale of that is there's about 40 to 45 million tons per year of what we call biogenic CO2 emissions from forest products facilities. So overall, the forest products industry, it is, it is declining, unfortunately, um, but the forest products industry um, has emissions of stack based emissions of 50 to 60 million tons per year. The only industry that's larger on, for stack emissions is actually the oil sands. Um, you know, these are more stack emissions than steel, aluminum, oil refining, and cement combined. But they don't show up in a lot of the large emission inventories because it's biogenic. That's the, that's the critical thing here. So, Number one, we see this, these existing emissions, which are a removal, you know, if we put them underground, are a removal from the atmosphere, we see them as a starting point for an incredibly large BEX industry based in Canada. Uh, it makes sense to start at where we already have existing forest products facilities that are producing significant volumes of biogenic CO2. And when we capture that and put it underground, that is a permanent carbon dioxide removal and that is actually a saleable product. That's the key thing here. And so 
Um, what we're doing is we're working on adding carbon capture and storage to existing forest products facilities. Great. So you're helping um, these existing facilities uh, largely move from their current bioenergy production to adding CCS to achieve carbon removals. And so bringing us to the project that ERA is supporting with you, um, we're supporting a front-end engineering design study with Torchlight um, at a pulp mill to implement BEX. So I would love it if you could tell us a little bit of background around the study, um, the purpose, and what you're hoping to learn. In this sector, partnership is critical. So I am not a subsurface expert. We, you know, in Torchlight, we, you know, we understand trees and agriculture and waste, um, but it's largely above ground and carbon cycles, et cetera. Uh, so we're partnering with Vault 4401, uh, based in based in Calgary, also with significant U.S. operations, who are subsurface experts. So they know how to store CO2, right? And that's that's their expertise. And so, you know, bringing that. But then we're also working with Hinton Pulp. So Hinton Pulp, when we started the study, I uh, was owned by Wes Fraser. Wes Fraser is the largest lumber producer in the world um, and producing uh, board as well. And so Hinton Pulp is was one of their uh, five pulp mills. Uh, Wes Fraser has actually sold that facility to London and Vienna-based Mondi. Mondi is uh, a leader in um, craft pulp production around the world. Uh, and uh, Mondi is, is investing um, over $600 million into modernizing Hinton Pulp um, for, their own, for their own product. So that's really beneficial for, for, the, for the project, um, which is called Rocky Mountain Carbon. Um, so Rocky Mountain Carbon, uh, and this is, you know, most pulp mills will um, emit between 1 and 2 million tons of biogenic CO2 emissions from the stack, right? So Rocky Mountain Carbon is essentially adding carbon capture and storage to Hinton Pulp. Uh, the overall volume of annual carbon dioxide removals from the from Rocky Mountain Carbon would be about 1.5 million tons of CO2 per year, 1.5 million tons of carbon dioxide removals per year. Because when we do capture, capture actually has a very large energy uh, load. Right, so capture uh, requires heat. It requires electricity for compression, etc. And so we actually need to build a new combined heat and power plant, operating on biomass, um, to to provide energy for the capture facility. One of the key differentiators here, and if there's li- you know listeners that are knowledgeable in the CCS space, is that when you add carbon capture and storage to a fossil fuel the only possible outcome is more expensive energy for that energy consumer. That's the only outcome, right? That's why there's been challenges in trying to add CCS to, for example, power plants. However, when you add carbon capture and storage to biogenic CO2, instead of trying to reduce a regulated liability, you know, in the form of fossil fuels CO2, you're taking a non-liability, biogenic CO2 and turning it into an asset. What that actually does is it lowers the net cost of energy generation or potentially pulp production for that facility because it's another saleable product, right? It reduces the net cost of the the co-product, the original product. And so that's a very different business case than adding CCS to fossil fuels because it's creating this additional revenue income stream. So the Canada Energy Regulator, uh, in a gl- modeled a bunch of scenarios out to 2050, you know, you know and what is going to be the energy supply mix? In a net global net zero world, the number one source of of electricity in in uh, Saskatchewan, number two in Alberta, because they basically said run out of biomass, would be biopower. That's not because the cost of electricity generation from biomass is is lower on a kilowatt hour basis than wind and solar. It is because there is a co-product that lowers the net cost of electricity generation. And the Canada Energy Regulator modeled that in a global net zero scenario, the the electricity price in Alberta and Saskatchewan from a BEX facility would actually be negative. So how does that work? Because the value of the, as the value of the carbon goes up, the net cost of the co-product energy goes down. So this is how we can actually decarbonize 
while at the same time ensuring that we have affordable energy. And this is why Alberta and Saskatchewan have such a massive competitive advantage compared to many other jurisdictions. Industrial scale carbon capture, North America's first hydrogen powered locomotives, using drones for reforestation. Since 2009, Emissions Reduction Alberta has been helping to deliver on the province's environmental and economic goals by investing in projects just like these. Projects that pilot, demonstrate, and deploy clean technologies across our industries. Whether it's detecting methane from space, producing biogas from Alberta's agriculture industry, or one of almost 300 other projects in our portfolio, ERA's investments in these game-changing technologies are reducing emissions, lowering costs, attracting investment, and creating jobs right here in Alberta. ERA's funding is sourced from the Government of Alberta through the Technology Innovation and Emissions Reduction, or TIER, fund, which is Alberta's provincial industrial carbon price. For more information about Emissions Reduction Alberta, visit eralberta.ca. You mentioned that the Hinton um, pulp mill Rocky Mountain Carbon is a 1.5 megaton per year opportunity. Um, can you give us a sense of what does the opportunity look like if we were to expand the technology across Alberta and Canada? So looking at just the existing forest products facilities in Alberta, we're talking in the range of between 12 and 15 million tons of carbon dioxide removals per year from existing facilities, right? This is adding CCS to the existing, uh, there's four craft pulp mills, uh, there's two mechanical pulp mills, and then there's a whole bunch of uh, lumber and board facilities, right? So that's, th those um, are uh, an existing opportunity that, that, you know, I think that is a, a logical starting point. It's important to recognize that the timber harvest in Canada has gone down significantly since 2004. Uh, it's down by about 45% um, since 2004. Obviously, the primary driver for this has been digitization, right? In terms of we're not reading newspapers anymore. Canada, 2000, we were the, the world's largest exporter of newsprint. We were more than the next 10 countries combined, okay? So that industry is down by about 85%. Uh, that has led to significant reductions in timber harvest. Um, which then, you know, incidentally leads to uh, enhanced wildfires. So that is, you know, kind of the, the basis. What we can actually do is build new biopower, combined heat and power, BEX facilities that provide negative carbon intensity electricity to the grid and negative carbon intensity heat to the industrial sector, for instance, the oil sands, and to the building sector. Um, via district heating systems. So we can, that's why, you know, when we compare BEX to things like DAC, direct air capture, bioenergy, you know, the key part here is bioenergy with carbon capture storage. It also generates energy at the same time as a carbon dioxide removal. You get four, for a combined heat and power plant in Alberta, a combined heat and power BEX plant in Alberta, you get four decarbonizations in one. You're decarbonizing electricity, you're decarbonizing heat, you're generating the carbon dioxide removal, and you're avoiding wildfire emissions. Seems like a pretty good deal to me. Seems like a really good deal. Um, so now that we've talked through all the advantages of BEX, I wanted to flip to some of the challenges. So maybe you could tell us about some of the challenges facing um, specifically your project so far and maybe some of the initial learnings that you've encountered? So w the biggest challenge is monetization, quite frankly. Um, ultimately, and we're seeing this on the, the carbon capture and storage side with fossil fuels, is surety of policy that we know that there's going to be a carbon price. It is very hard to invest in facilities uh, at this scale without knowing whether we actually value carbon, right? That That is the reality is that, that we don't value carbon unless policy says we do, right? Uh, particularly publicly traded companies, for example. So we need surety of policy. Number two, with BEX, there's an even kind of additional hurdle because you actually need a buyer for that carbon dioxide removal. 
And while the International Governmental Panel on Climate Change says we need billions of tons on an annual basis from BECs, carbon dioxide removals from BECs on an annual basis, and we have thousands and thousands of companies making science-based target initiative commitments, the volume of carbon dioxide removals that is clearly required has not been sold, right? So that is part of the challenge is that the, the buyers, while if you know you want to meet your actual, I mean, realistically meet your climate commitments, there should be thousands and thousands and thousands of buyers. The number of buyers has actually been very small. So Microsoft has been by far the leading buyer of carbon dioxide removals. And because they've assessed all the permanent carbon removal options, they're by far their largest investments in purchases have been from BECs because they're affordable and they also generate energy. And so if everybody was doing the same as Microsoft, the monetization would not be such a big challenge because realistically, Microsoft's emissions are very small compared to you know global emissions. Um, and so that is one of the critical things that's that's challenging is that monetization. In general, we have the voluntary market, which is what Microsoft is participating in, but we also have the compliance or regulated market. You know, one of the really attractive things though about Rocky Mountain Carbon and Alberta is that we already have the tier market, right? We already have the tier regulations and there is a pathway to monetization already built in. And bef before we move away from challenges, is it fair to say that there are, you know, technical challenges associated with BEX projects similar to other CCS, for example, in carbon capture? Or is there anything else maybe that's worth mentioning around forest management in terms of technical challenges? Yeah, so what I would, number one is that uh, we can use pretty similar post-combustion capture technology to fossil fuel-based CO2. It's all about the purity and contaminants within that flue gas stream. One thing I should mention though, is an alternative technology pathway to BEX. This is not applicable for existing emitters, but uh, for new build facilities, there's something called oxy combustion, which is basically where you're using pure oxygen instead of air for when we, when we do combustion, we're taking carbon, we need to oxidize it. That's what releases the energy. That's why we get C O2 because there's oxygen that needs to go in there. Most of the time we're using air as the source of oxygen, but we can also use pure O2, pure oxygen for that combustion. What that means then is that the flue gas has a very, very high CO2 purity. Basically, there's not really any nitrogen in it. Nitrogen is the main component of air. So really, there's not really any nitrogen in it. So the we, while we need so, a little bit of upgrading, generally, you know, we don't need a big capture plant after the fact. There's a, a third consideration is here is, is that in the Nordic countries, for example, and you're seeing rapid expansion of this in, in, other, in other European countries, is the cities are actually heated with large scale biomass combined heat and power plants. So Stockholm, Copenhagen, they are heated you know, over 90% of the buildings, over 99% of the buildings in the case of Copenhagen are connected to the city-owned district heating system. That means it's underground hot water pipes. And instead of having your own furnace or boiler in your building, you get hot water for your space and hot water heating from the district heating system. That allows you to have centralized combined heat and power generation. And in the case of these low carbon cities, this is biomass. It's exciting to hear that BEX may be a, a pathway to catalyze investments in next generation capture technologies that um, you know have improved environmental footprint and other cost and efficiency advantages. So that's um, that's exciting to hear. Um, and so I just have um, a few more questions, um, but I did, and you touched on this earlier, um, but if you could just reiterate for our listeners, why Alberta? Why is Alberta a good place to start? You mentioned in Europe, we have some BEX projects underway, but that's not the case yet in Canada. So if for Canada, why is, why is Alberta the right place to start with, with BEX? I would actually argue Alberta is the best place in the world to do BEX. And this is, you know, there's three, three primary reasons and then some other sub reasons. So number one, to do a BEX project, you need biomass resources, right? In Canada, we have a very, very, very large 
uh, biomass resource in terms of the forest, which actually needs to be more actively managed. When we look at Bex, a lot of it comes from the fact of the need for a market for low grade wood to do climate smart active forestry. So I can get into what that means, but that's the number one, you know, that's reason number one is a lot of biomass. Number two is low cost onshore CO2 storage, right? That is a competitive advantage. So the Bex projects that are being developed in Europe largely need to use offshore CO2 storage in the North Sea. And so their costs of transport and storage are actually larger than their capture costs, which is the reverse in Alberta, right? Capture costs dominate the overall dollars per ton CO2. So we are dramatically lower cost for the transport and storage. Number three, we need rule of law, right? And I say rule of law because we're, what we're talking about here is long-term contracts on, you know, let's be honest, putting hot air underground. And so um, what that means is that, you know, I say rule of law because Russia has a significant BEX potential as well, but I don't see them selling CDRs anytime soon. So when we then get into some of the other really competitive place, you know, reasons for Alberta, some of it is quite frankly policy, right? So, and, and ownership of rights. So if I'm developing a BEX project in Alberta, I need to do lots of consultation, but ultimately I have a contract with for storage with the government of Alberta because the government, the crown, owns the CO2 storage space. If I'm in the US, in the Southeast US, which also has a very large BEX opportunity, very large uh, forest products industry in the US Southeast, is that, um, you have to go in most states landowner to landowner to get the rights for co2 storage and so that is much more challenging and that's why you're actually seeing a lot of companies go offshore with co2 storage because they don't need to go from landowner to landowner so it's it's about rights for co2 storage that makes a big difference in the case of bex because in canada 94 percent of our forests are publicly owned i.e owned by governments they inherently have to be involved in in the development of this industry as well. But we see this as a not only essential for meeting climate goals and decarbonization, but also how Alberta and more broadly Canada can win in the energy transition because these carbon dioxide removals, while we can use them domestically to reduce emissions, they are also an export product. And because they are an export product, we can sell them to other countries around the world and other emitters around the world that do not have the opportunities in Bex that we do. Great, thanks, Jamie. Um, and maybe I'll just, just to summarize uh, what I heard is that Alberta is the perfect place to do Bex um, because of our forest carbon opportunity, our carbon sequestration opportunity, so permanent removals that are low cost compared to elsewhere in the world, and we have the frameworks in place to make these high capital cost kind of long-term strategic projects uh, make them happen, get over the line. So um, that's that's great to hear. So I just want to shift um, for the last part of our interview to talk about, um, to come back to the project and talk a little bit about what the future looks like for Rocky Mountain Carbon. So, um, so right now, as we discussed, this is a feed study, front end engineering design um, to look at BEX on, uh, as a retrofit CCS on the Hinton pulp mill. Um, and Rocky Mountain Carbon is, is leading that. Um, but what will it take for that feed study to actually uh, to go to final investment decision and become an actual operating project? Yeah, so the project essentially has to get that do risk. That basically means on the obviously on the technology side, on the flue gas supply side. Um, if you're going to put a large capital investment on the back end, the flue gas supply, namely the pulp mill, has to be secured on the front end, and that's why Mondi's investment in Hinton Pulp is so critical. So that's one thing. Um, then obviously you have to de-risk in terms of the transport and storage. So. Uh, we're fortunate that Vault 4401 was awarded one of the Alberta CO2 storage hubs. So it's called Rocky Mountain Carbon Vault, uh, pretty appropriate name. And, uh, and then also because there is a additional combined heat and power plant, the fuel supply for that combined heat and power plant also has to be secured. Those are all really important, but I would say the number one decision point or critical 
action that needs to occur for the project to be developed is to be able to monetize these carbon dioxide removals because that is the primary product from the facility. Awesome. So I just have one more question for you. Um, so let's say that this feed study is successful. The challenges are overcome. We are able to make Bex happen at the Hinton Pulp Mill. Um, in an ideal world, where do you and Torchlight see Bex in Alberta in the next 5, 10, 25 years? So Alberta is, in my opinion, the best place in the world to do Bex. And the International Governmental Panel on Climate Change has modeled that we will need 5 to 10 billion tons of Bex carbon dioxide removals by 2050 to meet Paris Agreement goals, right, in terms of warming. That is an that is a incredible volume. So if we can't do a couple hundred million tons of Bex removals in Alberta, I see zero chance of getting 5 billion tons or 10 billion tons globally, right? There are just not that many places that have the biomass resources of Canada, the on the low cost onshore CO2 storage and the rule of law. And so this Rocky Mountain Carbon is really the tip of the spear. It is a very challenging project because of all these different things that we need to de-risk. But it is a critical point of the spear to be able to gen to create a new industry. And what I would say is that about this industry is this is not wind and solar, whereby you're talking about domestic consumption. This is about utilizing the skill sets that Albertans have in subsurface, in boilers, in pipelines, in energy generation, and quite frankly, in forest management and forest operations utilizing those exing, those skill sets for an industry where we are globally competitive. Incidentally, the Canada Energy Regulator modeled that you would be moving biomass supplies from other provinces into Alberta and Saskatchewan for BEX because of the economic benefits of low to negative cost energy, but the onshore CO2 storage. And so it is also a mechanism, though, where Alberta can be the last barrel. Well, I don't believe that we're going to you know, fully eliminate fossil fuels. I just don't see this in the future. There is going to be a comp competition amongst uh, you know, oil producing countries. The oil sands have a competitive disadvantage right now in terms of the amount of energy required for their production, and those create Green, you know, when you're using natural gas, that creates CO2 emissions. Even if we do all the CCS projects, we are still going to be at a, a competitive disadvantage relative to the Saudis. The only way to beat the Saudis on a carbon intensity basis is to go negative. And fortunately, they can't do that because they have no trees. So this is how we can actually create negative carbon intensity crude. We can even create fossil fuel finished products, namely jet, diesel, what have you, that are actually on a life cycle basis, zero emissions. And the way to do that is for BEX, bioenergy facilities, to supply the energy for that processing. And really, nationally, we have to have the conventional energy industry, namely Alberta's you know, oil patch, come together with the forest products industry, and that is how Canada can win in the energy transition. I'll reiterate a couple of points um, I, you said that I thought really resonated was um, that Alberta does have existing um, knowledge of carbon capture and the whole CCS value chain. That is another reason why Alberta is a really good place to house BEX projects and then um, one more point is that um, even though, you know, Alberta's total emissions on a global scale may not be significant, since we're talking about removals here instead of emissions reductions, um, it's actually an opportunity for Alberta to make a material impact on our global climate goals um, by, you know, producing removals at scale. Um, so that's kind of another reason why, you know, BEX is, is exciting from that perspective and the Alberta context. Both Canada and Alberta need to recognize the rate of development that this is occurring in other parts of the world, 
and get out ahead of it because we have inherent compar- competitive advantages. And one of the great things about Bex is that we can create export product without having to build a pipeline, which as we all know, is really difficult. So that's where, you know, I see Bex as the critical part of Canada's role in decarbonization of not only uh, our country, but the world. Thank you so much, Jamie, for teaching us all about this exciting carbon removal opportunity for Alberta and the world. Thanks so much, Grace. Thanks a lot. Thank you.